Welcome everybody. This is Rohit Dadwal. I'm your host for the day, along with a very esteemed panel uh, on my website. As always, I would like to welcome and start this session personally and on behalf of all of us. Um, I would say we are deeply grateful to all the frontline workers who are working tirelessly to make our community safe. I think it's really important that we acknowledge that as we move forward. What I wanted to do was to start off the presentation with a small video on MMA and then uh, a welcome video on MMA and then uh, discussions and introductions to the panel and the subject I'm at. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, once again, welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of my colleagues from across the industry. Welcome to this edition of There is No Playbook for This. The discussion today is around content and creativity. Thank you to all our participants and to our um, audience and to my esteemed panel who, who has taken the time to be with us today. We are very proud to actually be able to launch this session. We did this uh, two weeks back and we've got a very, very good response to it. In fact, we've got recommendations and suggestions on what all we need to do as we move forward. So I'm personally honored and humbled to host this uh, on behalf of the industry along with, the, uh, with, our, with my team. I would also like to congratulate and thank our partners uh, at Conley because of them, we've been able to put this together and be in a position to share uh, insights with, them, with all of you. So a quick video before I go forward on Ad Colony and uh, what, we are, what their support is for the industry. Just one second. Ad Colony is the highest quality mobile advertising and marketing platform. With global offices across 25 countries, Ad Colony works with 90% of the largest Fortune 500 companies. Ad Colony's partnerships with third party verification companies, Nielsen, Moat, IAS, and Double Verify, guarantee your campaigns are brand safe, viewable, audible, and fully on screen. Certified by TAG, Coalition for Better Ads, as well as the IAB, Ad Colony delivers powerful results you can trust. Ads people like, outcomes you love. Thank you, Ad Colony, once again. Um, and at this point, I would like to invite all my panelists to uh, switch on their screens and uh, welcome them to this uh, session. I see Jessica uh, Pasutanto and Dick Van Mottman. So let me start with uh, Jessica. Uh, uh, Jessica actually is the director of uh, APAC Media and Digital Marketing Solutions at Disney. And uh, she's been working with uh, a set of talented engineers, as she said, across the region. And before joining uh, Dentsu, uh, before joining Disney, she was actually the GM of Dentsu X in Singapore, an ex-colleague of Dick's um, in, and she spent about the last decade uh, living in, um, most of Asia, China, Hong Kong, and um, Southeast Asia, working on innovative and creative solutions uh, for clients across industries. And uh, her work has been recognized in, um, as a very uh, accomplished uh, individual. She was the business leader of the year at the Institute of Advertising Singapore, and also a woman to watch uh, agents of change at Campaign Asia. So with that, Welcome, Jessica. Thank you for being here. Hey, thank you for having me. Thank you. 
With that, let me move on to uh, Dick Van Mortman. Dick is actually the former global CEO of creative and content at Dentsu Ages, a global citizen, uh, having spent uh, 30 years in the business across many continents, uh, mostly in Asia Pacific, and is an Indonesian, uh, Dutch, Indonesian, and Portuguese Jewish uh, by, uh, by his uh, bloodline. He's uh, also worked in DDB and uh, has 12 years in uh, Darcy, uh, Benton and Bowles uh, before he moved on to Densu. One, one of the first persons at, uh, in China to actually win a Khans for China. Uh, that's right. Uh, and oh, also the first foreign person uh, given the title of the Advertising Person of the Year by Chinese uh, Advertising Association. So a very accomplished professional and a speaker, uh, also works with us, uh, works with me personally on the MMA APAC board and is personally working on uh, eradicating malaria as part of the foundation M2030, an active speaker at a lot of the conferences, an angel investor and a board member and advisor at many places. Welcome, Dick. Thank you for taking your time on a Friday afternoon to be with us. Okay, that takes me to Pat Sutanto. Pat Sutanto is the chief executive officer of Surya Chitra Media, the biggest broadcaster in Indonesia. A very self-motivated person, an ex-colleague um, of mine, if I will, from Microsoft. Uh, he and I have shared the same legacy of working at Microsoft at some point in time. And a very passionate individual, um, currently leading the SCM uh, Surya Chitra Media strategy for broadcast industry and aligning the transformation into the new world of digital. Some accolades for Pa Sutanto uh, was uh, setting up the biggest boy band in Indonesia while serving as at Sony Music. And after Sony Music, even when he was at Microsoft, uh, his passion to drive music and has uh, built some of the biggest bands in Indonesia, whether it's Sheila on Seven, Padi, UOV, and some of the others. He's worked at uh, Booz Allen and Hamilton in Southeast Asia and is a chemical engineer uh, by profession, uh, something a lot of people actually may not know, and also an MMA, uh, MBA graduate. Works, I have the pleasure of having him also on, on, on my board in Indonesia, um, working to help build and transform the industry there. So thank you all of you for joining. I would... Uh, like to start the discussion by sharing um, a quote that I have in uh, most of the presentations that I do. And, but before I do that, I just wanted to quickly have uh, maybe 30 seconds from each one of you on sharing what your thoughts are on how this industry is evolving coming out of COVID. Dick, would you like to start? Okay, yeah, no problem. Um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a great Economist article uh, that came out a couple of weeks ago. I was not a big fan of The Economist for the last couple of years. I thought it was, a, you know, it was not going the right direction. But that article was really good. And it basically, the central premise was that COVID basically is accelerating change that was already necessary or in the making. And, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of platitudes, a lot of cliches that you can be using. You know, the Chinese have, a, have a, the character for, for, uh, for crisis contains the sub-character of opportunity. Um, it all depends on how you look at things, um, uh, glass half empty or glass half full. So I actually think that in a way, and I know it's very unsettling for a lot of people and there's a lot of, you know, um, uh, collateral damage, but what we're seeing because of this crisis is, is, is change being necessary, change that was necessary being accelerated and companies and individuals that are not geared for change, um, yeah, being a bit of a deer in the headlight uh, because of that. Um, luckily, um, again, you know, I'm, I'm also um, uh, borrowing from Johan Cruyff, a football legend that said, every disadvantage has an advantage. Luckily, the, uh, the, you know, the advantage that we can take here is that everybody can take a step back, we can reflect and have some time to decide, you know, what we really should be doing. And so I think 
you know, also in our industry, this time it's showtime. You know, we all talk about purpose. We're all talking about consumer experience. Well, if there's any time to show that as a brand, um, we can deliver the right consumer experiences and know our customers and can, can, can harvest the realms of data in a purposeful way, this is the time. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Paso Tanto? I Your think opening. your title is hit uh, right at the middle, right? There is no playbook for this. Uh, what's exciting or what's really differentiated this time is that, look, uh, normally when we are facing a crisis and the mode is try to preserve cash, try to slash all the costs, try to lay low, you know, right? Uh, trying to survive. But in this opportunity, because we are in the industry of content and digital, uh, clearly, as Dick mentioned, uh, the opportunity is all of a sudden huge in terms of we are making the leap of it uh, of uh, progressing in much faster way. But how to balance between, on one hand, we are on a crisis mode where money is not easy to find, money is not that uh, plenty to burn. And at the same time, we are seeing an opportunity right in front of our eyes how we can grab more audience. So balancing those two, I think, is the, the one billion dollar question, you know, how to do that. Thank you. Jessica, your opening thoughts. Um, so I, I think that I just echoed the speakers before and I did, did quote the economist, I'll quote Instagram. So I believe probably everyone on this call has seen a meme that's going around that said, who truly uh, impacted the digital change in your business? The CTO, the CEO, COVID-19. And it's really becoming the reality for a lot of businesses that this has spurred a lot of the innovation. I don't think that it's necessarily, as Dickinson said, drastically diverted from what we are, but it's become an amplifier. Um, it's become an amplifier of many of the changes that we've seen. And then it's a question of how are businesses tapping into them in an authentic way? Um, I'm sure we'll talk much more about this later, but the idea that a lot of businesses are sort of trying to take advantage of the communication crisis as a whole and what we're seeing rise to the top are very much businesses who know who they are and know what role that they play in their consumer's journey and how they can support them during that time. So I think the opportunity is really making that acceleration happen and the outcome of that will be how we very much strategically position ourselves going forward. Well, thank you for your opening remarks. Um, at this point in time, I'm gonna take two minutes uh, just to give you a quick, uh, to the audience a quick overview of MMA in case if people are not aware of it and just share a couple of slides so that we can build the help build the context of why we are doing this and what uh, what we are trying to achieve so we are an association body uh, helping build advertising and marketing our purpose is to help educate and train all the marketeers in the industry to work on advertising as we believe is going to be in the future we help build best practices, do a lot of white papers, build standards, and obviously do advocacy on, on behalf of the industry. And there are a lot of membership benefits that come along with this. One of that is continuous learning. This particular panel is part of that learning we believe we are providing to the industry, bringing thought leaders together to help share that. We've also done a, a hub or playbook of sorts on COVID for marketeers, COVID-19 support hub of what is happening, some of the best practices that are coming out of the industry. And that's all available on our website on MMA Globe. We are, uh, we are very happy to announce that we are launching a mobile marketing certification program that's gonna happen on the 17th and 19th of June. This is going to be the first batch, uh, four hours on 17th and four on 19th. So if you're interested, please do join us. And the other thing that we are doing very quickly is Ideathon. Ideathon is actually a hackathon focused on marketeers problems. So in case if there's any marketeer who has a business problem or a marketing problem and would like technology solutions to help solve that, uh, happy to uh, work with them. We are launching this on 1st of June. Uh, last date to register would be on 16 June. So if you have a marketing problem, please do reach out and we'll be happy to uh, support uh, and discuss that. We expect about 100 teams, 100 developer teams to work on it. And this is some of the upcoming webinars and panel discussions. Uh, please log on to MMA Global and you'll have a better view of what's happening. As, as I said, a uh, very esteemed panel uh, with me. So once again, thanking them. And uh, 
as uh, before i went into a quick overview i said i always like to start my discussion with a quote and this is the quote by Mil bill moyers creativity is piercing the mundane to find the marvelous and i think this this to me personally it doesn't happen that everybody likes all quotes but to me this personally is very appropriate when we are looking at content and creativity and especially in the time that we are uh, it's a laid back time if you will not much is happening so it is a mundane activity if you will to find the marvelous and we are all trying to do that in our own way there is no better way to figure out what creativity will apply and how will that go forward so with that let me start with my first question digital uh, which uh, dick and jessica uh, and uh, sudanto all all of you mentioned has kind of forced this better change or has forced our hand on what the new world will look like it was not the cto not the ceo not the transformation not the crowd fund not the buzzwords that we've heard in the past none of them it is covid now with that in mind what do you think is the biggest disruption coming out of covid that people will be looking forward to working on uh, making sure that it it becomes an apt flow or flow for content and creativity to go across markets across different segments and is then creativity leading the content in in different circumstances so can i start with pasutanto because this this is a, a time where the old is getting disrupted and as a broadcaster you have that biggest uh, scope of work or the scope to change while maintaining the status quo with the broadcast industry i think uh, this whole disruption is really changing all of the basic equation that we have known for a long time right uh, so i think what Uh, will become outcome of this will be people are willing to take much bigger risks in terms of changing the formulation. Uh, uh, so, for instance, as you said, right? Uh, typically, when you talk about creativity, the output will be the content. The other side of the equation is clearly the monetization. So then, different content will have different type of monetization. A good example is let's say a movie. You know, you uh, produce like multi million dollars budget, and then you put it first within the movie theater, and then from movie theater. Initially goes to the DVD, but now with the OTT, it goes to OTT before it goes to DVD and so on and so on. So uh, up to the way that we have this UGC, where the cost to produce is almost none, and then it goes to like platform and so on, and then people basically watch it, uh, become viral, and then people are making money from the advertising. So all of a sudden, now if the movie cannot be shown on the movie theaters, so the question then is that would OTT be able to step up and then pay for the cost that it produced? Uh, such multi million dollars uh, on the movies so i think the answer uh, will not happen immediately because i think for the ott to basically sw swallow all of those costs will be too much to to swallow also so then the question is that how will that change how fast will that change uh, clearly this disruption will uh, will expect that that behavior but having said that i like to just give you one example that not necessarily it will change to the digital because sometimes the old habit still dies hard you know so one good example actually happens in indonesia because of the stay at home so the ministry of education uh, decided to do like three and a half hours blocking time on the state on uh, tv network tv live right and then what changed is that he requires all the schools to basically assign the students to watch the program and then to ask assignment based on their particular programs Honestly, I don't think that the content is like super duper interesting or state of the art, right? It's actually all contents. Yet, uh, by requiring uh, every uh, school to basically participate in assigning the students, and then we see that the rating of that uh, state TV like uh, triple, quadruple uh, overnight. You know? So again, so that's uh, what I mentioned earlier. There are a lot of things that is uh, changing, and then I think it's too early to tell what will the equilibrium look like, but it will be different from where we started. Interesting. um let me move uh, come to you uh, jessica pasutanto mentioned the new change that evolution that's happening from uh, broadcast to movie to dvd ott and so on so forth disney is very well placed in that space and obviously you have your own disney plus etc being launched and ott 
where does that change happen does that change happen at the consumer end or does that change happen at an organization end where does disney drive its inspiration to make those changes thank you for that and i think disney overall it comes from an organizational value set uh and this goes back to something i said at the very beginning which is Disney isn't necessarily a movie company or an OTT company. It's a company that tells stories. And so with the heart of what Disney is, innovative stories that touch people. We are then able to look through products and content through that lens and reconnect with what that human element is. So if you look across say Disney's channels right now, particularly related to studios, they're still quite active. Um, but instead of launching new studio content, we are connecting people with our animators so they can learn how to draw their favorite characters. Um, because that is the magic of what Disney brings to people. It is not necessarily rooted in the film. There is an entire business model um, that we can talk about later. But what the core business is, all of our content gets looked through from that stream. And I think that is, um, as I mentioned earlier, something that COVID has given companies the opportunity to do. When our products can't go out as we envisioned them to do from a functional point of view, this is the time that a lot of companies come back and go, what are we to people? How do we rediscover our role in their lives? Um, and if we can create content to be creative around what that means, that's where you see the magic come in. So if we look at the trends and the opportunities that COVID's brought, we saw gaming taking off in APAC. We've seen it rise 10 to 20% in some markets, singularly over the last two months. Um, we've seen cashless transactions take off. We've seen messengers that were already dominating skyrocket. So it's not necessarily about just looking at how can I sell my product, but is what is my product's role in for people and how do I match them to the ecosystem that now COVID has created. Um, and I think I think we lost uh, Jessica. Did we? Yeah, okay. So just moving on uh, in, in the spirit of keeping this discussion going. Uh, Jessica, we lost your voice for a while. Um, but uh, something she said about how, how do companies look at what they bring in terms of what their goals are and what they can bring to the organizations. So did, I wanted to come to you with the next thought in mind is creativity and content don't don't necessarily strive by themselves. They all need to come together. And there's um, we we have to assume that creativity starts does not start from a big idea because if that was the case, then a lot of the small ideas, a lot of the creativity that is being built in the madness that happens in innovation and in disruption, etc., will not come up, come across. So, if the companies are thinking of what they need to bring to the table and what what they need to do, what I want to ask you is looking beyond just the content and creativity when companies look at you having worked across uh, a lot of these organizations when when you look at that what do the companies look at beyond the purpose and authenticity of the content there has to be a fundamental purpose for organization what do they think of what is that that we go and try and strive for thanks Robert. Um, and actually uh, what how jessica just uh, you know, approached it uh, you know, helps me to set it up. Hello, are yeah. you still there? Yeah, yes. Good. Something changed in the uh, something changed in the screen for some reason. Um, you know, I think um, the, the one thing that uh, Jessica just mentioned in terms of how she how she bridges uh, the consumers and the makers. For me, that is a perfect example of what I talked about or have been talking about for the last couple of years when I approach transformation. And my last job was, I would argue, more about transformation that, than it was about advertising. You know, having, uh, having joined Jensen seven years ago as the first non-Japanese to lead the region. Um, and the key of transformation is to, is to define yourself by value and not by form. And in the end of the day, what consumers buy of you is a value. If it gets delivered in a more convenient form or a different form that is relevant to today's age or or moment, then all the better. But it is really the value that, uh, that uh, consumers buy. And I think 
that's personally why I have an issue with the, the hype about digital transformation, because, you know, that is almost like digital is the panacea. No, the ability to, to, be, to embrace change, to guide change and to constantly morph the delivery of your value proposition to the present times, I think is what is essential to a, to a company. And creativity needs to be seen in that context because creativity needs to have a purpose. And we do, I always say, we do commercial creativity. We do, you know, we do creativity that needs to build brands and business. So, you know, if we take it for instance to present times, how do you do it in present times where people are oscillating between utility, people have real needs, you know, kids being home, stuff that they normally would would buy in the shop or browse in aisles and find they can't do now. Um, plus escapism, they want to have some comfort. Plus the ability to now see passion points, because I think you can clearly clearly see from the data and Paso Tanto and Miss Channels and, and Jessica Disney, they must be able to see what is the content that people are gravitating to much more. Right? And so to be able to embrace that and then say, okay, how do, what, what do we do with that? And one of my favorite examples of, of creativity or value proposition is a restaurant. It's a small restaurant here in, in Singapore. It's a Michelin star restaurant, it's called Nuri. When COVID started to happen, they saw it coming. They started to do something in the marketing already to drive more customers. When the circuit breaker was about to be was announced, they had a kind of last supper. So they filled up the restaurant, but also before that, they were sending the chef and the brigade to your home. You could book it. And now they said, you know what? Our value is not the restaurant, which is a physical form. Our value is to give you a culinary experience. And we can also do that by um, bridging our supply chain with, the, with our clientele, similar to the makers and, and, uh, and, and the, the, the makers and uh, the consumers, that, as Jessica just, uh, just mentioned. I think that is interesting definition of what you really bring to the table, the value of the, the, the customer value that you that you bring, but you're able to morph it every time. And later on, I can expand on it with a perfect example of, of cars, which are high ticket items and very difficult to sell, I would imagine. And I can, you know, I can, I can expand on that, but just in the interest of time, that would be my answer to your question. Okay, interesting. So, um... Jessica, just coming back to you, content and creativity obviously build on each other. One cannot exist without the other. Disney is a great example of that. Uh, whether it's uh, the Disney offline or online, these are these are great examples of how content and creativity. So, when when we talk about creativity, uh, we, Dick alluded to the content part, and so did Paul Sutan. But when we talk about creativity, there's this general consensus that creative guys are the crazy ones. They are the big, big idea guys. They are the misfits of, of the advertising, but they are the ones who are the troublemakers, but also the ones who bring the value of that content. They are the ones who bring the real demand from a consumer perspective, because they are the ones who think big. They are the ones who put the big picture in. So when you look at that, and not, not just Disney's hat, but as a creative person, what does it take for content and creativity to build upon each other? What is more important? Is creativity more important than content or vice versa? Or, or there's no real answer there? Oh, wow. That, that, that's one of the deeper questions I've been asked on the panel. Um, the truth is they need each other, right? Um, you can't have one without the other. But I, before I answer that fully, I would like to step back because I think what's hard here is that a lot of people on this call wouldn't necessarily view themselves as creatives. Um, I'm a media person. I am a digital person. I've worked alongside creatives, um, but I like to be, I like to think creatively, but in my own right, which is how do we take content and how do we link that with our consumers in a new way that really impacts them. And that lateral thinking is another form of creativity. And so a lot of times people just box creativity as a video um, or an ad. 
Um, but I challenge a lot of people to think of creativity as a new way of connecting. And if you can think laterally and use data to be able to connect better, that is creativity. Um, and if you can foster that within your organization, that is a creative organization. Um, I was asked uh, recently, so what is the best piece of advice I ever got? And the best piece of advice is actually from my old strategy director, a uh, brilliant guy, and he used to look at clients and go, how do you reward failure? And that usually silenced a room. Because if you can't answer that question, you're never going to get a creative or an innovative organization. Um, and using Disney as an example, how do we do that internally? Um, there's a company-wide project where anyone can pitch a story idea. It can be long form, short form, any format you want, anybody in any department. And it's that challenge of creativity can come from anywhere, from any insight. And so I think we need to rethink what creativity is before we can even move into content in a lot of ways. Um, and nobody's going to be able to do good content if you can't think laterally about creativity and make that an inclusive concept. Um, so I couldn't I, agree with that. <laughs> Sorry. I couldn't agree with that more. You know, creativity is not an ad. Creativity is not a form of content. It's about creative, creative solutions. Um, and um, I think your question earlier, Rohit, where you were asking about, you know, the big time creative. I think we need big idea thinkers um, that can also apply that creativity in in very relevant facets. You know, and we haven't talked about data. Well, you know, <laughs> now is the time to show how data can play a role in in, in personalization, in in contextualization of certain content. Um, and, and I think it's, it's not just about the big ad. Creativity comes in all its facets. Creative solutions to create a great customer. We all talk about consumer experiences. Consumer experiences, they're not, they not separated by off and online. The consumer experience should be a continuous experience that the consumer has with the brand. And is the organization, to Jessica's point, is the organization wired to do that? Besides the creative organization, is it a real customer experience organization or a certain value proposition organization? And will adjust accordingly what needs to be adjusted. Technologies will always change. You know, so which technologies do you embrace, do you deselect in the context of delivering that great experience? That, that That's very interesting and that, that Begs me to ask Paso Tanto. Paso Tanto, you manage uh, a network where we, uh, both Jessica and Dick mentioned about organizations and how creativity in organizations work and how do you develop organization culture around creativity. You have organizations where you have broadcast TV, you have digital assets, you have UGC assets, you have video assets, you have, you have a lot of that. And when you're looking at that spectrum of organizations which which are like maybe 10 15 companies under your portfolio and you have from traditional to digital um, from new age thinking to old school uh, management of uh, doing work uh, some of those fundamentally cannot change broadcast tv cannot change it is the way it is but at the same time you have invested in ott and video.com and so on so on. how do you develop a culture in organization which helps itself to develop creative workforce what is that creative how do you generate that to generate the content that needs to be done? You you were sharing some examples with me yesterday. So it'll be great if you can share some of that. But more importantly, from a leadership perspective, managing this entire workforce, how do you manage? What, what do you do? What is your advice to the people to think about? I think you raise a very good point, right? Because the, to add the complexity, especially in Indonesia, uh, even till now, but especially, let's say, when we talk about five, years ago when we started this transformation, TV free to air network was like the dominant factor because it uh, basically controlled two thirds of the advertising money. So it's like a big uh, mammoth giant that actually drive the conversation. So to do that, uh, to do the transformation that you mentioned about the creativity, uh, basically the approach that we do is basically we're splitting our companies because we uh, decided that we want to uh, transform. Uh, we want to redefine the way we uh, started just our business to from broadcast to become 
content and advertising. So content meaning that you know we have one company that is producing for like a prime time drama series. We have another company that is producing for like uh, theatrical movies, original series, Netflix original, and so on. And we have another company that is focusing more on the web series and the branded content. So if you can take a look at it, you know, like three or four different content companies, they are the same content companies, but they are delivering different type of contents and therefore require different kind of creativity, different kind of uh, what is right, what is wrong. You know, so mixing them will be quite difficult. So in a way, I was aspired uh, when I was with Sony Music, because at the time, Sony Music uh, used to have like two major labels. One is Epic and the other one is Columbia. So those are known for like big artists that would require like a big infrastructure support and so on. Uh, but interestingly, in every subsidiary, Sony Music allowed uh, uh, the subsidiary to create like a small label. Why small label? Because there are some artists that somehow do not like to go to big tall building. They would like to go to a garage type of environment, you know, being who they are, like uh, kind of like rebellious, so being independent. So then we have to come up with like a different culture to cater with this kind of creative uh, person. So that's the idea, you know, so you have a different company, so that way you allow different culture to be set up. And then because they are, sub, uh, they are approaching different type of, uh, uh, what call that, uh, constituent, so let's say whoever serving TV, then TV is always minded about TV writing, right? Uh, so while you are talking about the brand, so clearly the point of view will be like from the brand messaging point of view. So that's enable you to become more agile and then being different uh, uh, creativity to serve different kind of requirements. And so far it's working. So we have set up like multiple uh, creative uh, culture within our group. That's interesting. So. Let me, uh, there are a lot of people uh, asking questions. So please uh, feel free to uh, post your questions. Do remember to state your name, your designation and your company so that the speakers and the panelists have a context of where you are, uh, where you're coming from so that we can help answer those questions. We'll try and keep uh, 15 minutes at the end to uh, get, the, get to those questions. And if we cannot, uh, if there are a lot of questions, we'll make sure that the panelists do get back to you with the answers. So with that, let me uh, digress a little bit. Um, and there, it's always good to show examples. And um, let me start with uh, you, uh, Dick. What would be a great example of content that you, you, you alluded to it a little while back on that card thing, and I do have the video, I think, with me, of, and why would you think that would be a great content? So I just wanted to share that uh, with the audience. So. If you can just start talking, I'll pull that video up so that people can understand where uh, where you were coming from. Yeah, don't uh, don't get scared. It's a three-hour video. Um, <laughs> seriously, um, it's a video from Audi, and it basically takes you on a car ride, and it's beautiful. It's a car ride that happens throughout the day and night, and it just brings you back in touch with you know. The, the freedom, the feeling that a good car ride gives you. And in the process, they are able to also show off the car. Now, how many people will go and look at the whole thing? You can question, but I would, I, I know from experience that a lot of people would definitely would at least scroll forward to look at interesting segments and engage. Um, and I think at this present time, that's a beautiful way of for car brands to engage with with their consumers or potential consumers in the absence of you know being able to get them to the showrooms um, and it's also very true to Audi's values about the you know the Vorsprung du Technik the, 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 the driving experience that uh, they claim they have that's that's um, that's good and they deliberately call it a slow journey TV journey by Audi. So anybody who hasn't seen it yet, just uh, you know, go online, take a look. I think it's uh, it's brilliant stuff. Yeah, it's a it's a three hour video, so I have to, I'm not intend to play this, but uh, it, sure. it is available. So I, on find it, I find it great, but at the same time, and I'm not sure if this is where you want me to talk about it, Roy, or later. At the same time, buying a car, and I'm in the market at the moment for a car is an amazingly interesting experience where we can see how disconnected the constituents in that total value chain are to give you a seamless experience. 
and to potentially, you know, to pay a deposit and reserve their car. And it's, 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 it's real time. So I'm not sure if this is the time we're in where, where you want to go to all the panel, uh, panelists and have them share it. Maybe we can come back to that piece. Yeah. Um, Danto, content, the piece of content that really enticed you and um, something that you thought was very powerful. Sorry, right. so uh, I sent you this uh, picture about uh, how airline. Uh, yeah, yes. but uh, uh, I would like to because, like, uh, if you don't mind pulling like the live stream festival that we did, because I think that's also set uh, with the context that we just discussed uh, a bit yes. earlier, right? Yes. So, basically, uh, I'd like to share the kind of creative content that we are forced to basically of ourselves because give a chance that. Uh, for one of our subsidiary is actually in the uh, uh, event business. Uh, part of because of our strategy uh, action, we want to resolve to become an advertising uh, based organization. So advertising means that some of the companies actually want us to also provide services uh, with creating uh, on the ground events. So imagine now COVID, so no events that is allowed, right? So what happened then is that uh, they come up with a concept of how are the things that they normally do on a physical uh, structure, uh, which is to run a convention center and then we hire like a uh, bunch of uh, separate rooms and every room then uh, showcase like a different artist, whether it's musician, stand-up comedian, or uh, just a speaker, public, uh, public uh, speaker and so on. So we brought that entirely to the online. So we call it uh, what was uh, interesting here is that uh, it took us only two weeks from the ideation until finally, uh, uh, we uh, put it on the live stream. Uh, so we created six different streams uh, live. Uh, one is showing, let's say, the uh, public speaker. The other one is showing about cooking. The third one is talking about lifestyle. The fourth one and fifth one talking about music and so on. So the uh, live streaming festival is uh, doing fantastically, as you can see here. Initially, we started with only 135,000 watchers, and it goes on the third time we did it. Uh, it's almost 1 million uh, watchers. And what's interesting also is that all of these three, even though we have like a very short uh, period of time, we managed to secure sponsors. So this going back to uh, the point that I made earlier, which is when you created the content, so it's equal important on how you also uh, uh, put the monetization model. So this is. Uh, one illustration I'd like to share because this is uh, after a lot of brand people uh, in this uh, uh, discussion that basically a brand needs some sort of like a breakthrough so they can associate their brand with a unique event going on. Whether the event has happened physically or whether it's virtually, it doesn't really matter. So this is another uh, quick uh, example of Indonesia, which has uh, completed the one month Ramadan fasting uh, month, right? So in, during Ramadan, normally, uh, there is a tradition that people get together uh, to wait for the fasting period, right? Uh, so because again, we cannot do this physically, we do it online. So we started uh, the virtual thing with uh, having a musician uh, playing a music, and then we doing some cooking demo, and then finally during the break fasting period. So we already uh, do like some quizzes, and then the lucky winners thirties will be able to join like us. In uh, with the celebrities, so they can engage with each other. And then the rest uh, of the audience are basically just watching uh, through video.com, our platform. And then, as you can see here, that we also managed to get every session about half a million people watching for the show. So this is just like how you bring the quote-unquote still traditional type of behavior into a new platform. And then within a short period of time, uh, then we are able to basically like uh, build a new, uh, what do you call that, a uh, new habit of uh, following this. Okay. Moving on, Jessica, you shared a content piece uh, on the Australia tourism that there was an ad. Uh, so uh, if you can talk, you are on mute. Jessica, you are on mute. Always has to happen once during a presentation. Uh, yes. So maybe if you just share the link in the chat and I can just talk through it, we don't need to watch I, the whole thing. I, I the, I the thing the happened on the way home just a as part we of closed it. outdoors and explored smaller worlds. We looked out through the window and realised we missed you, maybe more than Avalon Toast. Now, that may not be true, but we'll tell you what is. Staying connected to mates, it's just what we do. So, look, there's the quacker, Roos, running amok, furry friends high in trees and green shoots, popping up. The fish are on a break from our sun-kissed bits. Whale sharks roaming quietly. Our silence, their bliss. 
What else is going on? Well, the winds are yet sweeter. The grass is getting greener. Uluru is having a rest. The stars are still twinkling. Sun showers are sprinkling. So, just wanted to give everybody a flavor of what you were talking about. Makes sense. And I think everybody probably is now itching to go travel somewhere after watching that. Um, but this, I select this video mostly because, this ad, because it connects to one of my earliest points, which is there are a lot of tourism boards and a lot of companies that realize their product is not something that can be sold right now. Um, but it's a question of how do you stay relevant? How do you connect to your consumers in a human way? Um, and what is your value to them at this time? And when you look at that piece of content, it's not earth shattering. Yeah. Um, it is something that was probably a lot of B-roll, to be honest. Um, it's not like they had to send a drone to do that. Um, but it recognized those elements of what they are to people. Um, and that's why I think that was a very accessible piece of to a lot of people in their audience in the terms of how you think about how you relate to the audience. And then to Dick's point, it's also an interesting piece of research because you can look at where people drop off. Um, you could do studies if you want to roll it out programmatically about how people respond emotionally to different points. So that also serves as a long term data piece that you can start collecting interest um, and collecting responses while connecting with people in a human way. So that is an example, I think, of the earlier point that is worth, is quite accessible and worth showing to people of how they can then replicate those questions um, in their own organizations. Thank you for that. Um, and I do also have a particular uh, piece of content that I would like to share with the audience, but maybe we'll get to that a little later. I just want to go to a couple of questions before we do that, and then I want to take the questions from the audience. Um, Content, creativity. In the new world, as we move forward, what we see is there is a lot more of that going to happen, where they, that came from. Now, content um, theoretically is getting democratized. Uh, anybody with a phone in their hand is a content creator. We've heard this, we've seen this. A massive amount of digital content that is getting created is exchanging hands between consumers on a day-to-day -day basis, pretty much between consumers, whether it's WhatsApp, WeChat, uh, Facebook, etc. The fact that it's easy, it's cheap. Uh, Paso Tanto said they took two weeks to build these three massive events, which in a real world would not have been less than a three to six months kind of an effort, theoretically. Just to give you an example. The fact that it's easy, cheap, and internet Internet is now pretty much everywhere. It is democratizing whatever creativity is there or the crowdfunded creativity that we were talking about all this time. And there are no boundaries now. The, there's a blur between professional and amateur, amateur content. Some of the content that I have seen in the last month or two months is amateur content. And I can tell you, it, it's wowed me. So the question there... Um, and let me start with you, Dick, given that you used to manage such a big pool of creative people. How do, how do you build the world going forward where content now is democratized and new business models are emerging, which, uh, which this particular digitization or the kind of COVID, the opportunity for everybody else that comes out of it is huge. It's humongous. How do you, how do you build from there? Yes, that's that's interesting. But, uh, you know, it ties a couple of things together what we've been talking about in terms of change and transformation and what I talked about form versus value. Um, you know, um, do we still need big ideas? Yeah, I mean, we still need big ideas. What we what we need very much is um, is, is the ability to connect humanity, the uh, ability to connect brands and humanity, um, and the ability to do that in a today's world where you can be everywhere instantaneously 24 seven, everything is media and everyone can be a creator. So what is your role as a brand in, in, in that world? And your role as a brand is a stimulator, is a connector, is, 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 is a feeder from, from, from time to time. Um, and the ability to have a real, uh, to, to, to know the sentiment and to, 
to know where your brand, how your brand can connect truthfully with that sentiment. And then to have that done with an agency construct. And I always used to say to my clients when I, when I met them, I said, you know what? I will not pretend that I see all the work going out of the door on your account. And it hurts me because I'm in this business because I love ideas. So my job is to understand what are your challenges? What are your opportunities? And to have the capabilities in the company and bring them together in a seamless way to make sure that we can help you. Yeah. And so, so in terms of the creative process, the, the whole process to develop the relevant creativity, it needs to have, it needs to be a process that is conducive to scale speed and contextualization. And it needs to be, needs to be done with people that are curious and people that are willing, that are, that are, are, are excited to have a big idea being served up in 5,000 different iterations, because that is what's possible and that is what will create success as against the, you know, you're, you're just your big bank commercial or your big bank app. It's about the whole construct, the, the, whole, the willingness to say like, okay, what is the real opportunity? What is the real goal? What is the real uh, brief that we're getting, you know, um, in terms of how to build the brand and business? What is the objective and how can we build a creative solution, now put the emphasis on the creative solution um, for that together. And I think that's why, you know, agencies in the past used to be very regimented in like copy art and then you have account. That's why, you know, it's all about bringing in different skill set and different constellations to be able to work together around certain opportunities and challenge and not to come from existing structures. Okay. So, Pato, Pato, uh, if you if you don't come from an existing structure, how do you manage? How do you manage the old school? Because that still exists. TV broadcast in in your example of print and magazines, etc. That that business is still going to be there. Content and creativity. Uh, Dick himself um, spoke about Economist. It's old school business. It's uh, it has a digital presence, but it's old school. So, how do you manage that transition? between the old and the new? Uh, I think the best way is to, uh, to put the right incentive for them so that whatever new behavior that they, we want them to change, so we need to make sure that the incentive is based on that. So a good example is that, again, if you keep uh, incentivizing your, let's say, the TV network, the most established one, just based on letting, and then they just behave like the way they have been doing all the time. Right? So by by now changing that we challenge them, look, can you create like a, how can you transform your content? So it's also popular on the digital, on the social media and so on. So then all of a sudden they find a new excitement that let's say one of my uh, TV networks uh, being so proud that they become one of the biggest, uh, what do you call that, uh, social media follower uh, among the TV network. So that's uh, clearly uh, changing the, uh, the behavior in terms of uh, putting the right context, what will be the scorecard that they are measured but as I said earlier, another way is simply to split the organization so that way they are given a different target, different behavior, a different culture. Uh, so in that way, we can also uh, pick more agile. But having said that, though, I just like to reiterate one point. Given the fact that we are in a digital world, right? I think Dick uh, uh, mentioned this about it also. It doesn't mean that the whole equation also changed. Because when you start, uh, I think it's a bad combination between content on one side and then platform on the other side. So digital is actually on the platform side. It doesn't necessarily change the whole element of content. So a good example, uh, look at the movie. I mean, Luffy, a movie has been produced for what, uh, 50 years ago, right? So movie is still a movie. And now people can watch movie in a different type of platform. Sports, an example. How different is sports today? Soccer versus soccer 50 years ago. I think soccer is still soccer, still 90 minutes, right? So again, uh, it's just a different uh, a platform that is showing the soccer. now. The difference then is that if in the past you only have one channel, so everybody is forced to watch the same thing, all of a sudden then you can watch like different type of soccer. So the unknown league become more well-known league. Uh, Esport that used to have uh, no visibility at all, all of a sudden now picking up because you know it's uh, growing outside of the traditional uh, media. Uh, it's coming from the digital because the youth like the esports, so therefore it's actually growing quite rapidly. So you know we have to put these two equations together. We cannot ignore that some of the content remain as it is uh, for the last whatever years, but there is a new content that came up because of the more platform being available and then the consumption uh, being quite different. So it's quite dangerous 
if you if you then believe that everything has to be changed. Some, uh, if you look at our OTT and even like Netflix, Disney Plus, and so on, the most popular content that is being consumed there is the same content that is being consumed in the free to air. You know, so. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Paso Tanto. Uh, so, to the panelists, you have all the questions in front of you. So, if you can start browsing, I will start with the first question, which is Digvijay Singh. Uh, he's um, he's not mentioned which company he's from, but he said, please also comment on content and creativity adapting to the change in the place environment of audiences, home with distractions. Uh, all around and watching on mobile or laptop screens possible with causing some casting to TV. Uh, Jessica, I, I guess um, this really is for you because you you guys have all of these uh, scenarios playing for you. Um, yeah, that is a question very close to my heart. Um, I would just say with this, we're very far away from being in a world where people are really putting creative front and center. And I think to uh, Satanto's point, digital is a platform and we have to think of it as being able to customize a solid message to those platforms in a lot of ways. And so people, I and D Disney's even deal to some extent, you just take a video and you go, okay, I'm gonna move this to, um, TikTok, I'm gonna move this to Instagram, I'm gonna move this to Facebook. And that's when you get those horrible horizontal videos and vertical placements uh, and you get tiny font and all of that. And people think that that is creative sort of going out into the world and it doesn't land. And then they go, oh, creative doesn't work. Um, and it's because we're not customizing creative concept to the moment where people are. Um, and it goes to the point of where is the human? Um, and how are they interacting with your piece of content? Um, back in my agency life, we had clients that made print ads and put them on Facebook and they said, why is nobody clicking on this? Um, so it, it, it's, a, it's a really difficult question because it, it just shows this sort of disconnect between your ad and the person consuming it. Um, my favorite question to my creative team is, would you engage with that? Would you click on that? Would you share that? Um, and if it doesn't connect with you as a person, why would they connect with our audience as a person? And so as we have all of these platforms to do that, our creative and our sense of where humans are and how we're engaging with them has to broaden. Um, so creative and content, I think the problem is it's so challenging because Dick was talking about scale. A lot of people are going that way that we just chuck it into AI and it cuts it different ways. Um, but you really have to be a massive advertiser to be able to do that. Um, for a lot of people, you're not going to be able to use AI at a scale, but it's looking at the specific instances you're connecting with people and how do you adapt creative, even if it is from a horizontal to a vertical, to make that engagement where the person is at the moment. Um, okay. So, Thank you for that, Jessica. Um, quickly, a yeah. couple of other questions. Um, the, fir the first that we have is from Joan Nugan. Uh, also a friend of ours uh, and works on the MMA board. His question uh, is, there's no playbook for what is happening now, but would this experience help the industry when the next global crisis will happen? And we know it's going to happen. So, um, Paso Tanto, are we, are we really doing this as a rehearsal for the next big problem that we are going to face as a society? Well, I think... Theoretically, the, uh, the right answer is yes, right? But the question is this though, who would thought that such a crisis, global crisis at this magnitude and then started because of this uh, pandemic? I think like, you know, like uh, uh, even a couple of months ago, people would say, ah, you know, nonsense. So, uh, so that's the challenge. What will be the next global crisis? Nobody knows because the type of crisis that we normally know is whether it's natural disaster or whether that's uh, economic crisis or like war, right? So as long as, uh, uh, I don't know if there is another technology somehow disruption in a massive way. Uh, so we do not know because depending on what kind of disruption, so we will only know whether we are prepared or not. But clearly, I believe in humanity that humanity will always have a survival, uh, what do you call that, uh, a force, right? So I also believe that we will survive this as a humanity. So whatever the next crisis will be, I think we will also adapt and then you know basically move on with the new norm, whatever that is. Great. Uh, Dick, um, a specific question 
from a business perspective having led such a such a vast organization uh, in in terms of growth um, this question is from john lyum uh, from new silk road investment and especially i i think from a china perspective and an analyst there and it's uh, directed to pasutanto and to all of you but given the fact that coming out of 2008 the print advertising saw a significant decline where do you see the digital advertising coming out of covid grow and instead of the decline in this case is going to be a significant growth from a business perspective where do you see uh, having work across the organizations across marketers and agencies in the global network i'm not completely clear where do, where do i see spending gravitate yeah. or yes how do how do you see the spending gravitate after covid i let, let me tell, let me share you my hope i hope spending will gravitate um towards um what i call providing the right customer experience and working back from that as against to just say oh digital is the panacea the digital is the answer um and maybe there is where i can <laughs> um put in that that car experience you know now all the car brands have have, have mastered to facebook at least they have nice facebook ads on there with promos that you can click and you click them and that's a sleek digital experience but once you click them your data goes to is handed off to a sales person that sales person then we'll engage with you in an old fashioned way by sending you pdfs on your whatsapp trying to entice you to to pay a deposit for a car and lock in this particular price you know it's like you just want it's like the disconnect between you know what you click there the nice the nice experience you have on facebook and then you get in the old world that for me is a, is a disconnected experience and so and i'm i'm sorry that i go hard back on it but i really think that is what we all need to put front and center what is the customer experience that we want to provide how do we then work backwards in all its facets servers product communication and how do we then amass that spending i can give you another example which is like how many of us have gone online to do their shopping and we have gone and we we click we fill that basket and that basket then shows you oh sorry these items have now gone out of out of stock how many companies then will say okay i recognize that these customers couldn't uh, couldn't get this sku or this particular product i'm going to retarget them or i'm going to redirect them so i hope spending gets redirected in a smart way to provide that customer experience I, I don't want to talk about forms or advertising, digital versus print. Everything, everything can serve a purpose. Okay. But the challenge is now to select it in the context of what you want to achieve. Yeah, no, no, that's and I think that's very right, rightly put uh, because it is really the context and something that we've been saying: contextual advertising, uh, personalized advertising. If if that is and the consumer experience is met, then I think that's the best case uh, scenario. uh coming to uh, one more question ed sharp from track world sports uh, and pasutanto i guess uh, i'll give this to you because you spoke about uh, live sports events not happening something that you baked an entire business around and it didn't happen so uh, given the fact that ed ed's asking is there's predicted 50% reduction in sports sponsorship advertising and so on and so forth in 2020 and especially olympics being postponed and so on and so forth what would your advice be what would your thoughts be of how do you change the working relationship how do how does this start to build how does live sports etc start to come back obviously gaming and online gaming and uh, all those things are starting to build towards live sports but what would the future look like how how would people start to build back their businesses on this Well, I think sport is sports, right? People love sports. People love this action of the life uh, match that people are, whether it's betting or whether it's the adrenaline, wanting to know who is winning uh, from the competition. So I think that equation will remain the same. 
uh, I think what COVID will change is actually going back to the quantification, what will be the right price to pay for the sports rights. As you see, right, typically the sports right goes for the three-year cycle. And then uh, historically, it's always like going up, 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 up to the point that it becomes so expensive. So I think this year is the only time that uh, all of a sudden nobody can watch sports. So the question is that can we move on with our life without sports or not? Can we replace the gap with other type of content that actually can uh, please the audience? And then the answer to that, I think uh, apparently we can live without sports, you know, unlike what other people uh, in the past saying, look, without sport, then uh, there is no life. Uh, on the content side. So what I anticipate, uh, some changes will be like those rebalancing, recalibrating on, uh, uh, there is a correction on the pricing on the spot that has been like uh, inflated for uh, for too long. Uh, so to reflect a more cost effective, uh, because like it's ironic that while it producing a high rating, but a lot of the spots rights end up uh, making loss to whoever network that actually acquired the spots right. So hoping that you know uh, going forward that becomes a healthier uh, balance ecosystem. Okay, thank you for that. We have a few more questions coming, but uh, we'll take one last question and then I think we'll uh, call it a day. But before I do that, before we get to the next question, I wanted to share a, a piece of content and creativity that uh, we thought was very apt. I shared it with the uh, panelists yesterday, and I thought it was very apt for the discussion today. So. Let me share that video. I, I think it was uh, it was very well done. So here you go. I thought this was really powerful and uh, what better way to kind of come to an end to a discussion where content and creativity, this, this to me was the perfect example of how content and creativity can at least sustain and build uh, for the future and build a hope for the future. So I, at this point in time, I really would like to take, um, thank the panelists, but before I let you guys go, I just wanted to ask you in one word, how would you approach the future? Just in one word. Fearless. Fearless. Okay. Jessica? Uh, I guess it's two words, but open-minded. Okay. And Pasudanto? I'll use the word agile because we have to be able to change whatever quickly, drastically, whenever we need. Wow. Fearless open-minded and agile. Uh, I wouldn't have uh, been able to summarize it 
as uh, precisely as the three of you have done. But uh, once again, I would really like to thank all of you uh, for your participation, for the uh, attendees, uh, for taking your time. And I think the buzz around content, the buzz around creativity is only going to get stronger with everybody uh, being a creative person. Uh, everybody has a creative trait in them, uh, whether they explore it or not. But uh, with democratization of content and uh, with accessibility to dig through digitization, especially during these times, I think there's a lot more content that's going to be seen, a lot more creative content that's going to be seen. And we are, um, we are positioned to actually build a future which is purpose-driven, as um, Dick and uh, Jessica mentioned, that if, if it's not purpose-driven, then it will not be helpful. But also to Paul Sutanto's point, uh, where he summarized by saying that creativity is not just, just something that you do right now. It has to be done with, with an agility, with, with a willingness to make sure that the content does not, a movie-like content does not just end up at, in a depository somewhere. So there's a lot more that's going to happen. We believe content is going to be, as they say, is the king, will continue to be, but uh, without its queen, the creativity is not going to sustain itself. Thank you once again so much. We appreciate your time, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next uh, event, which is next week um, on Friday. Thank you. Do join us for our next thank panel. You. Thank you, Pasudanto. Thank you, Dick, and thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Our next panel is on uh, 5th of June. Uh, we have Heidi Barar uh, from Pollard Group, uh, Ken Mandel from Grab, and Balki Radhakrishnan from Journal Mills, uh, based out of uh, Middle East. Um, the discussion for this is digitization and the focus around digitization. How, how does that one grow from there? Please do reach out to MMA uh, if you do want to engage with us, uh, participate with MMA. We have a lot of uh, content available on the MMA site. If you want to reach out to us particularly, specifically for something, uh, the email address is given there. And uh, list of the upcoming uh, webinars uh, is in front of you. Digitization and consumption, as I said, is on the fifth. And there are a lot more being added to this list. Uh, so do uh, log on to mma.com slash webinars and you'll be able to see all of them. With that, once again, we would like to thank you all for your time and attention and we'll see you on the 5th of June at 3 p.m. Till then, take care and stay safe.